from me, Lauren Joffe, and welcome to another episode of Derek Eretz. Using technology in education is definitely the way we're moving forward. On today's show, we focus on Jared Risen, who addresses youth unemployment through the Knowledge Trust. And Pamela Cantor tells us all about Read for Hope. But first, Rabbi Kievman explores the topic from a Torah perspective. Do you go on holiday or vacation? Where I come from in the USA, they call it vacation, but luckily here it's holiday. What's the big difference? Well, vacation implies, I guess etymologically at least, vacant, that one's time is empty. I'm just relaxing, just doing nothing. But the truth is from a Jewish perspective, never should there be a, a moment that is completely vacant, empty. We can't squander away our time. In fact, probably one of the worst things one can do is to kill time. Time is too precious to be killed. In fact, the beautiful term used here is we go on holiday. And holiday implies that we uplift our time with meaning, with purpose, with spirit. And indeed, education from a Jewish perspective is exactly that. I mean, think of the technology, what it has afforded us. When we read the verse, Hashem, that the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of God. I'm sure centuries ago, one wondered, how is that ever to be possible? Well, today, thank God for technology. I pull my phone out of my pocket. Wherever I might be in the world, on holiday, not vacation, I can tap into a shiur. I could go to our website, ChabadSouthAfrica.org. I can tap into a shiur, a lecture, a class, learn something wherever I go. We say this verse in the Shema every day. Whether you are at home or going on the road, once upon a time, you only studied when you were settled at home or in the shul, in the study hall. Today, you're going on the road. You can always easily pop into a lecture. In fact, your study partner can be any rabbi or rebbetzin you choose online, and you could control the speed. You could ask them to repeat their words. Just click rewind, Whether whatever channel you're using to learn from. It's so easy to learn in this way. And think about how technology has bettered us in that way, that never is there a need for vacation, emptiness, but rather holiday, wherever we go. We could always uplift our time. But of course, technology still requires some kind of discipline and thank God for filters that we could use on our devices for ourselves, for our children, for anyone who's using devices, technology. And you know, you think of lockdown, how we were able to immediately pivot. I know here at Chabad Seniors, as soon as we had to go into lockdown for COVID-19, we were able to right away move on to technology, onto Zoom, onto other channels to communicate with others and offer our shiurim. But of course, one needs that discipline. And for that, I have a thought to share with you from the Torah's description of the tabernacle, the mishkan that our ancestors built in the wilderness as per Moses' instruction to them. And we know that the main Furnishing the main piece of furniture, the highlight was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, of course, inside it was the Torah scroll itself, and there were the tablets. And yet on top of the Ark, the Torah describes, were the Keruvim, the cherubs. What were they? Well, the commentaries give us a description in the book of Exodus where we're first told about the construction of the tabernacle. And it says they were angel, angelic, ch childlike faces. Well, this is not the very first time we have the word kruvim in the Torah. In fact, if you go all the way back to Genesis, when Adam and Eve, the very first human beings, homo sapiens created by God, and they were given one instruction. They had the whole world at their disposal. They were in paradise. And they were told one thing, don't eat from that tree. And of course, what happens? From that tree, they eat. They defied the word of God. And they were expelled. The Torah describes how they were evicted from paradise, and in order to prevent them from going back in, Torah says outside there was this revolving sword and the two cherubs. But there, the commentaries tell us, the word cherubs is not defined as angelic childlike faces, but rather as malache chabala, angels of destruction, terrorists, demons. What's the difference? How do we have one word, keruvim, cherubs, in one place it means angelic childlike faces, and in another it means demons, destructive angels. And the answer, my friends, is very simple. In paradise, when Adam and Eve were first created, there was no self-discipline. They had everything at their disposal, and yet they couldn't listen to that one instruction, don't eat from that tree. When there is no self-control, when there's no discipline, 
then we become self-destructive. We could be like terrorist, demonic angels of destruction. Yet, when one is on top of the ark, where is the Torah? That is the self-discipline that one needs to have in life. When we follow the right path, when we have the right filters in place, then indeed, technology, which was one of the greatest breakthroughs of the latest of, of time, yet if you have that discipline, we can achieve and accomplish so much more. So Keruvim could either be self-destructive or it could be angelic, childlike, the most beautiful in the world. It's our choice which one we want it to be. Of course, now when it's time for vaccinations, I think education in the right way is the greatest vaccine to combat all the diseases of modern influences that we need. is that youth unemployment in South Africa is a massive issue affecting so many families and individuals. Today we chat to the one and only Jared Raisin about what he thinks about the issue and of course what the Knowledge Trust is doing to change things. The Knowledge Trust is an organization on a mission to make education accessible sustainably. We do this because we want to realize our vision of a world where every single person has an equal opportunity to reach their potential. Where it came from is five years ago, uh, we identified that really education is the hugest barrier that limits young people from uh, advancing their career and taking that next step. Uh, so we started a series of experiments, really, either to do with education or funding or employment. And five years later, the Knowledge Trust is a community of just under 450,000 young South Africans. We do have a community of about 10,000 Nigerians, which is growing quite fast. Uh, and we have about 400 commercial partners who support our mission by offering either earning or learning opportunities to our members. So really, we exist as a platform that's designed to connect on the one side, we have young people looking to reach their potential. On the other side, we have educators, training providers, employers, funders who are looking to create opportunities. And all we do is connect them as best we can. Uh, and our big focus is potential. We are fundamentally in belief that every single person has their own unique uh, journey and path. They just sometimes have roadblocks that are in their way and everything we can do to remove those roadblocks, uh, just to clear their path to be great, that's what we try to do. We connect our members to opportunities through our platform, which is technology driven. But it's very important to note that we have a team. Uh, we've got 23 young people working with this technology because tech can't do everything. And it's really uh, paramount that we have that uh, human touch and don't go full tech. But what the technology does, and if you think of the context of youth unemployment in South Africa, there are far more job seekers than there are opportunities. So if you had to put a, a job opportunity, whether it's a learnership or an internship or a bursary onto a platform, we get tens of thousands of applications. And if our partners were to do the same, they would get tens of thousands of applications. And what we do and the value that we add to them is the ability to sift through those thousands of applications really quickly using data that is collected through a curated journey that our members go on. But when we get to that last mile, once we've taken 10,000 applications down to a few hundred, then our people get involved and they look at the applications and they look at the profiles and they listen to the voice notes, which are automated on WhatsApp. And then we can screen it down even further with that personal touch. But yes, technology is a huge and incredible tool that can democratize access to opportunities. And the more we can make that tech accessible, uh, the more we'll increase our chances of fighting youth unemployment at scale. So the Jewish value that underpins everything we do 
is tikkun olam, which is betterment of the world. And the reality is that the Jewish community, whilst many of us have needs that we can't meet ourselves, uh, and we get support from the greater community, and the community is very supportive. No Jewish person is ever left behind. And we have a great privilege because of that. That is not the same for the rest of our country. Uh, and it's not for the same for the most of Africa. And Tikkun Olam says that we need to better the world for everyone, not just for us. So I had the privilege of a great education. I know how beneficial that was for me to be able to do what I can do today. I want every single individual in South Africa and the world to have that same privilege. And if that means that we need to extend that value of Tikkun Olam even to those who aren't in the community and do everything we can to give them that chance to take that next step, I believe it's our responsibility. Uh, we have to do it. We as Jewish people will never prosper and have a world that is uh, equal until we can include every single individual regardless of what community or background they come from. We have one metric for success at the Knowledge Trust, which is lives changed. And every life we change, we tell the success story. So someone in our team uh, will make a phone call to this member and say, hey, you've just got a job with so-and-so, or hey, you just got sponsored to study this bursary by so-and-so. Can you tell us your story? And we have thousands of those stories. They're on our website. Just go there and look for success stories. All those moments are highlights because it's what we live for. But I guess other highlights would be building our team. Uh, every quarter we bring new individuals into our team and every single person who works for us, bar one, was hired as an unemployed job seeker doing their first job through our platform. So we are quite literally a by the youth, for the youth organization. And every single time a new member uh, takes that step from member to trustee, we call out our team members trustees, it's a huge highlight. One of the big challenges in South Africa specifically is the disparity between those who need opportunities and those who are offering opportunities. It really is uh, a scary imbalance. And a lot of business owners or employers, when they think uh, of young people, specifically young people in their business, they see it as an expense. If they're gonna spend any money, they want to see what value is going to come of that. And they expect that value to come quite quickly. But we need to shift the mindset of business owners and employers to seeing young people as an investment rather than an asset. And investments, like all investments, they mature over time, they add value over time, but you also have to nurture them. You, you, you have to give them some sort of input an opportunity to flourish and to grow and to give you that return. So if we can get to the point where businesses are starting to think long-term, think bigger picture, the beauty is the whole country will benefit, but so will that individual and so will that business. We will never have a prosperous society until we have inclusivity in society. And if every single individual has the ability to contribute and the ability to earn an income, they are now supporting themselves they're supporting their families, they're supporting their communities, they're less reliant on external support like grant funding and whatnot, and they can then go spend that income on local businesses. Those local businesses can then grow and hire more people. The economy then grows. The person who employed that now is working in a more stimulated economy where their business will do better, but it takes time. So we just really need to get honest and authentic and real conversations happening between business and youth and educators because if we don't fix this issue, we will crumble. Uh, we are likely reaching a point of no return. Uh, when we started this journey, youth unemployment was in the low 50%. It's now 76%. That is ridiculous. We have the highest youth unemployment rate in the world and it's literally getting worse every three months. Every life changed is just one little step forward. And as long as we're taking those steps forward, it doesn't matter, as long as we're going forward and not backward, we're happy. And one life changed isn't just one, it's them supporting their family. That ripple effect is real. Um, and every additional person who's able to contribute to society is another person that's on this mission to take us forward. And that compounds, like just like compound interest, everything you add, it now multiplies out. The same exists for what we're doing. So it might take a while to get to a point where 
the change is exponential, but we will get there. I have no doubt, and I can't wait until we do. The Knowledge Trust's Derek Eretz is to make education accessible. Education is the one thing that if you can get it right, will change the world. Uh, educated people uh, contribute to society. Educated people can reach their potential. And if we can make that accessible to every individual, then we've done what we need to do. Literacy is such an important part of the education system, especially in South Africa. Pamela Cantor realized she wanted to do something about bringing books and reading to more children. So she started Read for Hope. Today we chat to her to find out a little bit more about why Read for Hope started and what exactly it's all about. Read for Hope is something very, very special to me. I started it during lockdown. It came about on the 14th of April, 2020. Because I'm a teacher at a public school and my children weren't getting any education at the time, there was lockdown, it just broke my heart knowing that my children were sitting in shacks or in different areas and not being able to, to have online learning or any type of learning. So what happened was, is that I came up with Read for Hope because I'm very, very into reading. I believe reading is so important. And what I did was I made a plea on Facebook to ask people to just send stories on WhatsApp, read for my children. Anyway, people started reading and people from overseas started to get involved. Different people that wrote books from overseas started to contact me and saying, can we read our books for your children? And it started off as a Summerwood primary thing for just my children, but all of a sudden, other communities said to us, please, we want you also to send us, you know, stories. So we started sending to different communities throughout South Africa, actually. And we even started putting up little libraries for, for places where children had never even seen a book or been able to touch books. So I think that education and reading are so important because they, they come hand in hand. I always say to my children in my class, if you can read, one day you will be able to put food on your table because you will be able to get that job. If you can't read, it, it's a very bleak future. Technology is very important. I know with even me now in class, what I try and do is I try and bring a laptop to try and get the children involved to see certain things because the kids don't really know, especially in the public school system. They're not used to all these things. But it worked for us in the way that I could send these voice notes to people that had data. But some communities don't have data, which made it very tricky. But most people do have smartphones, even if they are staying in rural areas or if they are staying in places like Alex. So it was quite easy to just send them the WhatsApp. A lot of children get the voice notes. It's sent to many communities, not as many as before because, you know, COVID isn't as rough as it used to be and we're not in lockdown anymore. But it goes to a lot of different communities. Children, like at Summerwood, some of the children still get it. Um, we've sent them even to the deaf community. We have videos where people were actually signing stories. We also did for um, the blind community, which was the Nkosi Nati Foundation. We sent them stories as well. And the children would send me little voice notes to thank me. And it just, it touched my heart. It's just, it was just so beautiful. You know, they just loved it. And yeah, it's very, very special. I think it's definitely a soul thing. I think because I 
I have a, a Jewish soul and because I have the love of people and we taught that to be honest to to love you know everybody and to try and help I think Read for Hope definitely came out of that and it's, it's part of what I grew up with it's it's something that I was taught that we need to help others it's very important so it definitely has evolved from the voice notes. Now we, we're setting up much more little libraries all around. A lot of people have been coming, you know, to collect for their little libraries. And it's quite amazing because a lot of the other foundations are joining onto my foundation and asking me for things, which has been great. So the networking has been quite nice, you know, different foundations need this. If I need this, then I can ask them. So it's, it's it's definitely grown in different ways. I am hoping to expand it more. I really feel that if every school and every little crash and hospitals even could maybe try and build up a library, that would be my dream. That would really, really be my dream. My Derek Eretz would definitely be to help others to do whatever I can to help the needy or underprivileged and for Read for Hope it would definitely be to be able to make a more literate community nation. Well, we've come to the end of the show for this week's episode of Derech Eretz. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a Facebook message at Derech Eretz Connect. From me, Lauren Jaffe, and the Derech Eretz team, have a beautiful week. <laughs>